Hey guys, we're uh, Richard the Fishmanado channel here. Uh, first day of Magna, and we're heading towards Neptune Systems uh, annual breakfast. Hey guys, are you guys excited? I'm scary. <laughs> oh, we're running a little late. This is no good. Here we go, my friends are here. Hi Nancy, yeah. what's up Paul? Hey, what's up? Hey Tom, man? how are you guys? Good. <laughs> this is me, my name is Rich Ross. This is my wife, uh, she won an international skating competition. This is my daughter, when she was little, she was really hungry. Um, <laughs> she read towards us now using all that energy and we take Halloween very, very seriously. <laughs> Before we get into the epic stuff, I was just in the field doing some coral uh, restoration and spawning work, and um, we hear a lot of terrible stories about uh, the reefs, and uh, this is a terrible and good story, and I think these are important to share, so I'm just going to take a minute and do that. This is the uh, Elkhorn coral, Aquator cervicornis. It's critically endangered. It's a Caribbean Atlantic species. And, um, on this particular trip, it's, by some estimates, 90 to 95 percent of it is gone in the last 50 years. 90 to 95 percent of the coral cover is gone. And while I know that number, it really didn't mean anything to me. And on this trip, uh, uh, just out of the blue, we went and circled a coral graveyard, which I have never seen before. So this is the kind of stuff we saw. And you can see the divers or the snorkelers in the background there up on your right. Um, and I've never seen a coral graveyard like this. It just went on for areas the size of this room. This reef has gone down since the 70s slowly. It started with some disease, and then there was a diadema urchin wipeout, and then there was some bleaching, and then there was some uh, high temperatures. And it, it's really just kind of shocking. All of this is dead. Um, but it's still up, for the most part, doing its wave-breaking function. Um, really just kind of awful and horrible, and it tells me why we do the kind of restoration work we've been doing. This is that coral alive. You can see it's not nearly as big as uh, what, we, what, what we saw in the graveyard. And what we do, uh, um, at my work now, we have a project called Hope for Reefs that's working with the Nature Conservancy and Project Seacore, Sexual Coral Reef Reduction. So what we do is we go out and we inspect corals and we decide, figure out which ones are going to spawn. Uh, which, uh, and then when we know which ones are going to spawn, we see this. And you can see here those, those kind of pinkish white dots. Those are the egg bundles, egg sperm bundles, getting them ready to, to be released from the mouth of the coral, the polyp. When we see that, we tent the corals up with this kind of device like this, and then the corals start to spawn. And uh, we should get to it in a second. And that's a big coral bloom. And then uh, the, bu the bundles are uh, positively buoyant, so they float up, they go into these tubes, and we collect them. And on this trip, we had a massive spawn um, in three different sites, which is fantastic. So we collect from as many colonies as we can, and then we take all of those gametes together, and we mix them up in a big soup, and then we try to raise them up. Um, so the spawn was a pretty, pretty amazing thing to see. Uh, we fertilize the larva in a big stew, like I was saying, and then baby corals swim around. Did you guys know that? The baby corals swim. Is that, it's always insane to me that they do that. Um, here's ones getting ready to attach to the substrate. Those are little corals. And they can really motor around. It's kind of cool. You don't get to see that often. They finally pick a house, and you can see uh, next to the penny how small they are. That's a single polyp, brand new animal. What we do is we take that soup I was talking about, we throw it in these pools. And this is all experimental right now. Next year, we hope to really be rolling it out for proof of concept. And we want them to attach to those tiles. They're called tetrapods, and they've got good surface area. And the idea is, instead of going out and fragging pieces and gluing it out to the reef, which has got a big hit and miss ratio, doesn't necessarily grow up as much as you'd like it to do, and it's very labor intensive, we can spawn and get millions and millions of baby corals on those tiles, and then just toss them out on the reef, and those things are designed to lock in place like that. So um, it wasn't only that we saw the coral graveyard, we did also see a replanted reef um, that was designed, that was taken by fragments of opportunity, which means frags that were broken and were going to die. And they were transplanted to this other reef. They grew up over five years and they spawned big. That was actually the footage of the sun. So in, in an era of, of when you're talking about acquiring uh, you know, 
know, wild coral reefs and, and how dismal things are. There is areas of hope. We are very clever animals, and I think we're going to figure out what to do. And if this project works, we'll know in the next few years, it should go a really long way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this again at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to that. Uh, this is where I work at the Academy of Sciences, where I run a 212,000 gallon reef tank that uh, kind of looks like that in the late afternoon. Um, and it's uh, based on an area in the Philippines. It's got five different windows. Each is a specific dive area. This is um, Devil's Point. And over here, this is based on a place called Dead Palm, because there was a dead palm tree in the water. There's no longer a dead palm tree, but they still call it uh, Dead Palm. Um, this thing's 10 years old, and it is finally starting to look like a reef. Uh, it occurred to me last year that we need to treat it like a restoration site, not like an aquarium. Because when you put a fragment that's as big as my head in there, it looks like a, a pico flag. So uh, we're throwing a lot of coral out of it, and stuff's starting to grow. At my house, I have this secret home lab. I do stuff with octopuses. And uh, I think this should be my favorite video ever. <coughs> or not. Never mind, you don't get to see it. Anyway, this is my home tank. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tank and then show you how I use Apex and why. Um, this is how the tank started. I'm a lazy, I'm a lazy ass reefer, as Joe Wyula would say. Um, this is how we started uh, with the super hip ferns at the top, pretending to hide all that equipment. My wife loved that. Um, then we were doing a floor remodel. It's a 150 gallon display tank. We did a floor remodel, so I took the opportunity to build everything in. So I built an armature up there for the lights, then built a couple of soffits, uh, took out a bathroom door, put in a new door so I could have access to the tank from behind, and um, built this. And you can see there's a big two foot tall door there um, so I can get to everything, but more importantly, so I can hide everything. I can leave it completely messy because I am lazy. Um, you close it and it looks like that and it's much better. Under the house uh, is a fantastic thing if you can do it. I put all the crap down there. That's a 40 inch crawl space. It's about 14 feet from the tank. And um, there's a 180 gallon sump down there and another 50 gallon sump. Uh, and if there's a flood, it's fantastic because it just goes onto the floor. Um, and uh, I pretend to clean it up once in a while when I take pictures, but uh, it's got a door, that's what it looks like. All the, uh, the DI is on the side, and the carbon's on the side. And you close it up and it disappears because I am lazy. Um, this is the back of the tank. You can see the back of the tank through. Uh, the door in the bathroom, so you can actually watch this while you're on the toilet, but no one ever does that. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem I was having with the tank in the first years was that these I had four metal highlights. There were two 250s in each of those uh, uh, luminar fixtures, and they would heat up the water. And, and where I live, about three or four weeks a year, we get really hot stuff. And um, so it was kind of a drag, because you never know when that's going to come. In California, in this area, we have microclimates, and it's weird. So I'd get home, it would be 84, and that would be distressing. Um, and I had a chiller outside that would come on and off, but that was annoying, because chillers don't really do what you want them to do, unless they're on all the time, and really kind of keeping it at the same level. Um, and this is when I was introduced to Apex, and I got the first Apex. And you can see it there, it's on the door up there of the bathroom. See? Apex. Right here, toilet, out here, hallway. Uh, and that's the back of the tank. And what I really used this thing for at first was really just to turn my lights on off when it got too hot. And that was a fantastic thing. And I, if, if, if you read any of the articles I, I, I've written or any, I've seen any of my talks, I'm a real fan of distributed systems. I'm really worried about everything being in one basket. Uh, especially because the single biggest point of failure in any reef system is the reef keeper themselves. Um, you'll see that in a minute. So I didn't want to put everything on the apex. I, I didn't trust it. Um, so it was really just monitoring and it was running the lights and would turn them off when it was hot. Um, I slowly put other things on it. Uh, I got a, when Vortex came out, the, X, uh, uh, the WXM module came out, I did that. That seemed like a really nice thing to do, uh, to be able to, to control it through there. But none of my critical systems were on it, uh, because I have multiple pumps in the tank and returns. They're all on a different circuit. So if anything borked with the Apex, um, the other stuff was on, and I wouldn't lose the whole tank. And the other way around, if anything borked with my other stuff, the Apex was still working. We're all good. Uh, and I really liked the WXM modules because it, it made everything easier to program because I am a lazy. 
Uh, so that was kind of uh, my introduction to Apex. That was all I did with it. And then everything changed because I killed my tank. Um, not at all because I'm lazy, because I'm an idiot. And we're all idiots at this point. Late at night, for some reason, uh, I, I had, I, I was seeing a little bit of ammonia. I thought I was seeing a little bit of ammonia. So I dosed Anquil. And I'm telling you, if it's after 10 o'clock at night, and you think about doing something to your tank, don't. <laughs> Put everything down, and go to sleep, and look at it in the morning. If nothing's dying, don't do anything. If you get home from a vacation, and you notice your sump is low, don't go to the sink and fill up a thing with water and pour it into your tank. Don't do that. Don't do anything when you're tired. Um, so I killed all my SPS. Uh, it's okay to kill your tank. Um, What's, because that's how we learn, right? What's not okay is to kill it the same way twice. So, I've killed my tank three times. Uh, once, uh, once with caulk, once with caulk in a totally different way, uh, which, is, which is okay, because it can't happen now. And, and, and that second time, uh, I ended up doing a little bit more with the Apex with it, but how I saved what I could save from the caulk overdose was with the Apex, because uh, the caulk overdose drove my, um, what is that called, pH? pH was like 10.8, <laughs> which is bad, and the fish were. Um, so I grabbed a long line from my, and put it on my CO2 from my calcium reactor, which was uh, being controlled by the Apex at this point, ran that line 20 feet into the tank, and then change the set points on that uh, to control that uh, CO2 dosing and allow that CO2 dosing to bring my pH down. Came down within 10 minutes. Uh, I took it apart, went right back up again, so I set it up and left it all night. The fish came back within five minutes after the pH got down. So Apex saved my fish there. Um, and this time I just killed it by hand. Well, I can't even believe I did that. It was like right after I mapped that was awesome. Um, yeah, we don't know what happened. I, uh, we don't really know what's in the animal. Well, I'm talking way too much about this. Um, but don't do it. Don't use it at 10 times the dosage, and don't put it directly in your tank. Um, so everything was dead. It's actually funny. All the LPS were fine. Everything from the bottom third of the tank was okay. Almost everything from the top two thirds was dead. So this was a great opportunity to switch to halides. I mean, not halides. From halides to LEDs. Because uh, why would you switch if you've got a thriving tank? It just seems like a weird thing to do. You need a compelling reason. Um, so I did that, and it went really well. And then I went up to do a talk in Seattle and then uh, re-met this guy. This is Dwayne. He actually helped me install that two-foot door because I don't know what I'm doing. Dwayne is an Apex nerd, which is fantastic. And he got me talking about the Apex more and was really telling me that I should do more with it and that he would help me, which is fantastic because I am, I am a lazy. Um, so I got, uh, we did a bunch of stuff and I'm gonna show you some of that in a minute. Some of it, hi, how are you? Hi. Here you go, you want to read it. <laughs> Um, and to show you how lazy I am, this, I'm so, I got a breakout box. Wayne said get a breakout box, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. The first thing I did with it is set it up so when you open this door, the light goes on in the crawl space. I am literally too lazy to flip a switch, literally. Um, I am also lazy and I don't want to deal with mixing water or carrying uh, big, big things of salt around. I did that for 10 years, I got annoying. So now this man uh, brings water to my house, which is fantastic because I am, I, I am lazy. And we pump it into these tanks and now I can use uh, Apex and I'll show you in a sec how to pump it uh, uh, to my system because I am king <laughs> All right, let me hide this for a second. And, um, and as I was uh, putting this together last night, actually, let me unhide that. Hold on one second. Uh, as I was making sure my talk was okay, it was a nice, it was a good thing that I did that because um, my talk was not okay. My talk uh, fell apart last night, so I was putting it together again. And 
I mean, we looked at what Terrence and I had talked about, and he said something like, just you know, show people how you use Apex. And by no means, if you haven't understood it from what I was showing you before, I am not an Apex master. I am a user. I want to use the technology. I don't care how it works. I, I, and Apex is getting better and better at that for me. Uh, uh, and, and one of the most amazing things with Apex is the community. So not only is there Dwayne, who uh, I can text or whatever, and he'll, he'll say, I'll say, how do, you, how do I change the speed of this 20 times a day? Just give me an hour. And then he sends me code, and I put it in. And actually, now he just puts the code in, because that's how lazy I am. Uh, <laughs> but there's also the community, which the community is fantastic. Uh, and uh, because pressing buttons made me nervous, because I've got no input that pressing the buttons did anything, if I'm, if I'm gone. Uh, I do have this here as well. Let's see if this works. I have the Nest camera, which is good, but it just gives you this wide view. Uh, but uh, um, I hope my, parent, my wife's not walking around naked. <laughs> Actually, I kind of hope she is, that'd be great. <laughs> I've been on the road for a long time. Uh, so it kind of gives you a view of the tank. Actually, what time is it there? There, there might be a better hide than that. <laughs> this might happen. Um, but it starts so I can turn lights on and things like that, so that's good. I, I'm actually not going to show you that screen. <laughs> um, so here I can't see anything uh, because the, the light I have and the sump is on. Uh, but so if I hit D over here, the light will come on and maybe all this will work. There you go. So that's my, that's my, oh, little just a sec. That's my disgusting, horrible, under-house, lazy system. That's my general view. So it's great. I can look at this when I'm on the road and I go, everything looks good. Things are running. Uh, things are nice. I can even do this. This camera's got a really nice function here where I can go and go, let's see. The main thing I care about is my um, caulk drip. I'm oh, not my caulk drip, my um, calcium reactor drip. So let's see if this all goes. Should automatically move to a new location. And there you go. You can see, you can see right there, the calcium reactor is dosing. You can visually see that it's going, right? So if my pH is crazy, I want to be able to turn off or on the calcium reactor. But I also want to know that I've turned it off or on, so I can double check that. If the alkalinity is crazy, I can change that as well by changing the set points. This is all stuff I did last week. I come to the calcium reactor pH, open it up, and I go, oh, if my, if my pH is too, if my, if my alkalinity is too low, I'll come in here and I'll lower these two set points. If it's too high, I'll raise these two set points. 5.1 is generally what I do. You don't want to go too big because you're not there. Um, and that's incredibly useful. Uh, and on the graph, I can see my alkalinity going down. As the corals were growing, alkalinity went down, uh, which is an interesting thing to learn with the alkalinity monitor, the boom and bust of the usage of alkalinity. So I want to keep it up. Uh, I can also keep it up here. I have a uh, dose system that doses um, caulk. And the same thing, you click on it here. And it's dosing 1,000 milliliters, which is, how many liters is that, Jim? <laughs> One liter, good, good. He's, he's, Jim's good. Modify interval. All this is so easy to go here. Uh, while I was gone, I changed it to 8,000, which, uh, which is like 16 liters. Uh, no, it's eight liters. Um, and then I was able to watch it over the next day or two. So it's, it's, it's incredibly helpful for me uh, when I'm on the road to be able to see what's going on. Uh, there's a couple other things. Okay, here we go. Uh, temperature, who cares? These are all my lights. You can turn them on and off. That's great. Um, let's get back to this, and I'll show you the King Lazy super awesome thing. Oh, it's up here. Sorry. So let's look at the skim mate. Would you make that baby quiet, please? I'm talking. <laughs> there we go. There's my skin made bucket right there. So this was another thing I loved about the Apex. So what happens with skimmers, right, is sometimes they go crazy and they pump a lot of water out. So I put a float switch on it so it shut off the skimmer. Uh, if that happened, so I wouldn't lose too much water, right? Because has anybody had that happen? Is that just something they use that? Right. Now, that thing's run by the apex of the breakout box, which is fantastic because now, when that thing fills up, I get an email that says that switch has been flipped. So I now know when I'm on the road, 
if I have to drain it, and then I know how often I have to drain it, because something may be weird going on. If I have to drain it four times in three days, something goofy's going on. But watch this. This is so King Lindsay. You're going to love with this. <laughs> right? I'm going to drain it. Oh, I love that I can be somewhere where people want to watch a bucket of sludge water drain. <laughs> Come on, Wi-Fi in the convention center. <laughs> there it is. Oh, something happened. Oh my God, it's great. Oh my God. It's not refreshing, but you saw it go down. The there we go. <laughs> yes, that's what an idiot I am. I want to watch that happen. And look, the skimmers come back on. You can tell because that line there. Uh, that's dumping water into that bucket is directly from the skimmer. When you start up a skimmer, it often overflows for a little while. And I can watch that. And look, there it's going down. And I don't care that this is chuggy. I'm often in the field on some island and I've got terrible internet anyway. Um, as long as I can see stuff's going on, I'm super, super duper happy. Um, so that's great. And I can watch that and be happy about that and see how that goes over the next few days and turn it off and on as I need to. Um, it's a, it's a real peace of mind thing for me. I have to go back to D here. The salt fill, I can add fresh water or salt water to the tank, but I can visualize that happening while it's happening. Um, so I can see how much salt water I'm using, how much salt water I'm adding, and I know if I add a couple inches, uh, evaporation over the next few days will cause my salinity to go up about 0.5 parts per thousand. So I can, I, can, I can be on top of all that kind of stuff like that. So, the peace of mind I get from the Apex and then combined with a, finally a pan tilt zoom camera that actually helps is, is just unbelievable to me. Um, new things that are going on. At work, we are setting up a, 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 an in-tank coral spawning tank. So we're going to mimic the conditions in the wild to get corals to spawn in our lab. Uh, uh, Jamie uh, Craggs has done this at the Horton Museum in London. We're going to do it. And what that involves is basically setting up a big black box, a big dark room that you put your tanks in so you can totally control the lighting. Lighting is really important, but uh, also temperature. And what that means is I can no longer be a lazy because I have to go under the hood into the old style dashboard of the Apex and put in all kinds of stuff to make sure that the light changes uh, the same way it changes in the wild and the temperature changes the same way it does in the wild. That's, that's really exciting stuff, and it's stuff that we couldn't even consider doing 10 years ago, five years ago, because it just couldn't happen. Uh, I can control the lunar cycles as well. So it's, it's shockingly, it's amazing, and it's fantastic stuff. Uh, I am a fanboy both for being a lazy and for being at work where I'm not allowed to be a lazy, and we'll be getting this kind of spawning work in our lab uh, uh, next year. And of course, got to thank these people because, uh, as I said, the Apex staff is great, the Apex community is great, and uh, that's that's all I got. And uh, we're going to get on to some other things. Thank you for your attention.